Yo, what up street gods, this is Eric Kim. All right, some uh, turbo thoughts. So this one is, we are not only the new Spartans, but we are also the new uh, street photographers. So what does this mean? How to apply this in life, uh, etc. So it's kind of randomly thinking this morning, <clears throat> like what does it mean to be a street photographer and why do it, etc. And one notion is, to think of street photography as training. What is training? Um, it comes from the ancient Greek askesis, askesis, A-S-K-E-S-I-S. -E the same word as ascetic, A-S-C-E-T-I-C, -E not like aesthetic, like the way things look, as uh, ascetic, like a ascetic monk, like living a simple pared down lifestyle. And in the early Greek days, it was actually seen as training, as a form of hardening and strengthening not this like you know become some emaciated monk take on some weird vegetarian diet and just kind of self-flagellate yourself and i think this is important to consider because what is the point of training and exercise i mean for the ancient greeks and for the, the spartans it was to always just be in tip-top shape to be ready for war or battle uh, whenever and what i actually do admire about the the Spartans was, I mean, I might, get, I might be getting my history wrong, but it seemed that the general gist was, you know, there was Sparta, like this colony of Greece, this land, right? It was kind of like, imagine like a Switzerland, like they're just like, just, just kind of leave us alone. We just kind of want to do our own thing. Um, and they weren't really interested in like, you know, going out and conquering other lands and augmenting their own wealth and stuff they're just like all right this is our society leave us alone <laughs> we just want to we just want to like be topless keep working out and look sexy and uh, whatever um and then what happened was there's invaders who would always come and try to take over sparta right like you know the the persians also the 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 movie 300 is actually based on true story the battle of thermopylae um Reading, uh, watching the movie and the reading the ancient accounts is actually pretty spot on. It's actually quite quite hilarious. But anyways, <laughs> except the part where he's like, "This is Sparta," and just kicks the dude into the the hole. I wish I wish I could do that. That'd be that'd be pretty badass. But anyways, um, and so you know, and also when it comes to weightlifting and stuff like that, it's it's all connected. I swear, right? Is that whenever you meet dudes at the gym, right? Like always ask people, say, oh, what is your PRs or your personal records or how much, you know, can you blah, blah, blah. You know, how much can you bench, squat, deadlift, whatever. And a lot of guys, especially guys who are like a little bit older-ish, they'll be like, oh, I used to be able to do blah, 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 blah. But, you know, life happened. I can't do that. And my, my old max was blah, blah. And then now I could only do blah, blah, right? And I think this is an important thing to consider because... The best state to be in life is to be at apex condition. So for example, even now, or Kim, uh, 34 years old, right? This is the strongest I've ever personally been in my personal life. Like rack pulling, essential. At this point, I should be able to rack pull six plates, six 45 pound plates and a 25 on each side, uh, which is what, 630 pounds, 635 pounds, 640 pounds, I don't even know at this point. Um, and I did my squat walk or my nano squat or my whatever you want to call it with like six plates, a 10, and a two and a half on each side, I think. The only thing that's, um, that's uh, a little bit low right now is my floor bench press. It's like two plates and a five. I think it used... I think it used to be two plates and a 25 on each side or two plates and 30 on each side. I don't remember, but anyways. So the purpose of training is, um, I mean, there's there's some pragmatics, right? Is that like, it's, it's just good for your, you know, your, your soul is that nobody wants to be a past skeleton of themselves in the past. We want to be the newest best version of ourselves possible right so for example like let me just use the technology example i think this is actually a good example so the difference between um you know, it's so funny it's like 
everyone wants to be their old past selves. And I think it's actually quite silly. Like, they're just like, oh, you know, I used to be able to do that, 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 does it. But now I could only do that, 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 that. And so, for example, right, like, you know, what are we on the iPhone 40 right now? <laughs> iPhone 40 Pro. Pro. <laughs> so can you imagine yourself where you're just like, Oh, I used to be an iPhone 4G, but now I'm only an iPhone blah, blah, blah. Or, so, okay, so currently we're on the iPhone 14 Pro, right? Can you imagine being like, I wish, I miss the days when I used to be an iPhone 7 or an iPhone 8 or an iPhone 6S. I'm like, no, bro, like you want to, you want the 14 Pro, you want the iPhone SE, you want the M2, right? Or like people was like, oh, do you remember back in the good old day when the OG iPad Air was out and it weighed like 10, 10 pounds? And it's like, those are the good old days, right? Um, no, I prefer the, I'm using the iPad Pro M1. The M2 is out already. Um, I was recording this in selfie mode. And yeah, I, I, I love it. I think it's, a, it's, it's phenomenal. So with technology, we always want the newest, most modern, most updated version of things. Why is it that... We want to be a past self or a past thing. I think the best thing is to just consider and think the best way to, to be things is always the newest, 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 newest version of you. And to pioneer different techniques and approaches and stuff, right? And so even with uh, cameras, I mean, I think, uh, I still think that the best camera is probably the Ricoh GR3X, which is the newest Ricoh GR digital camera. Look how, look how effed up it is, right? I think I have like over a million actuations on this thing already. Um, I think if people are curious, I probably take around like 300 to 400 photos a day now that, you know, I have Seneca and I could, I could just shoot anything. Um, and just shooting... I experiment between extra small JPEG and small JPEG. I think maybe small JPEG might be better because when I import photos onto my iPad Pro, um, I think the resolution actually still looks a little bit better. I think the, the extra small might be a little bit too, too small. Uh, that's also the funny thing with small things. It's like you want it to be small as possible, but not too small because when it's too small, it's, it's, it's actually not good as well. Anyways, so... With street photography, I think it's a good idea to treat it kind of like an ethos or an approach to things where regardless of what your lifestyle or your life is, you adapt street photography to it rather than adapting your life to street photography. Uh, let me give an example. So I'm currently in the uh, living in the concrete island archipelago of Orange County where there are no sidewalks and you're like stuck in a car for at least an hour, hour and a half a day. It's, it's not too bad, right? So I've actually found that just keep, you, you know, keeping your Rico GR in your front pocket and then, you know, you're parked at a traffic light, you know, don't get into car accident. And then I'll see interesting things. I'll just uh, take photos outside uh, the car window. And actually it's a good creative thing. And also just to photograph suburban life or, you know, I go to this Irvine Spectrum probably every other day, just going there and shooting street photography in the outdoor mall. I think so. I think the intelligent thing is to adapt and you could shoot street photography anywhere you are or whatever style you are. Even when I was living in um, East Lansing, Michigan, when Cindy was, uh, um, you know, getting her master's slash PhD at uh, Michigan State, uh, you know, there's no human beings. That's what caused me to, to pivot and start doing uh, kind of urban landscape photography. And actually, I found it very, very rewarding. You know, Kyle boxing, did some boxing photography, street photography, documentary stuff. And so I like the idea that street photography is more of an ethos, a methodology, a technique, an approach, rather than like a concrete notion of things, right? So any nerd who's just like, this is street photography, this isn't street photography, whatever, I'm like, okay, A, you're just super close-minded. B, 
like what do you personally gain from trying to to close down the barriers of this thing um even a lot of people who judges and stuff like that everyone everyone's biased right like so for example let's say you enter a photo con i i give you a uh, real example right so let's let's say you enter a photo contest right and then you got a bunch of judges right and let's say the judges themselves i mean most photographers tend to either gravitate more towards color or black and white let's say right and so then the you know the you look at the street photos right and the trend right now is towards color so then if your photo is in black and white you might be judged a little bit less favorably than if you're in color so let's say i love black and white and then someone showed me a color photo i mean i i, I love both but who knows i might be low, more low-key interested in the other person who's work kind of looks like mine than not and that's also the tricky thing too right is that um it seems that most teachers are trying to turn their students into just mini clones of them but i think the most authentic way to approach things is to actually Look at the student, look at their style, look at their approach, look at their lifestyle, look at their living situation, whatever, and try to help augment their photo abilities to their personal maximum rather than making them a, a mini you. Now, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I think most teachers have the best intentions possible. But then again, you have to also be careful about teachers too because uh, a lot of um, teachers, photography teachers at the... You know, if they're lecturers or if they're like at a local community college or, you know, teaching at some sort of photo center or workshops, whatever. Uh, I don't know, but I wonder if actually a lot of photo teachers do it begrudgingly because that's all they could do. And, you know, they got to pay the rent, so they kind of like they they still like and love photography but it's just kind of like this kind of doing it more of a a financial obligation rather than out of super abundance like my t friend tim flanagan for example he's great because he just teaches photography because this is is his passion he teaches the middle school kids uh photography um and even for me now uh you know my primary focus on teaching workshops is that a it's fun for me i enjoy it b i like bringing you know, super awesome people together c i like uh, sharing turbo thoughts d um everyone makes photos it's it's, it's, it's it's good fun and it's just like a genuinely enjoyable thing and actually the interesting thing from an entrepreneurial perspective the benefit of um charging money for something is that when people actually pay money for something they're actually more invested in it and they actually tend to work harder at it. Um, so, I mean, certainly it, 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 it depends on the, the person, but sometimes when, um, um, once again, this gives a uh, different situation, typically younger people who are kind of more eager beaver, if you give them a full scholarship, they actually really do thrive. But it does seem that people who are like a little bit older and then, you know, maybe like some financial difficulties, you give them a full scholarship. I've actually noticed based on my personal experiences, they actually kind of, A, are not that appreciative. B, they don't actually work as hard either. So I think, I don't know if I learned this from Nassim Taleb too, but then, um, you know, at least if people are older, maybe it's a better idea to give people partial scholarships, not full scholarships, because... If it's a partial scholarship, they still kind of got skin in the game. They got to hustle hard. So even for myself, um, I I went to UCLA as an undergrad, uh, and you know I got a bunch of scholarships uh, and financial aid, but I didn't get a full full ride. I still had to do work study, and um, fortunately I didn't have to take out any loans. My my work study covered my the rest of my tuitions and stuff like that. And I, actually, I think it was a it was a positively good experience because you know when you have to learn to uh, to work part-time while you're a student you actually are much more efficient with your time rather than all these other kids whose parents are funding them they just like waste time playing video games and stuff like that so it's actually been a positive experience for me so like even if uh you know son goes to college like i'm not interested in just you know bankrolling him i'm just like bro you gotta you know <laughs> get your own scholarships you know i don't i don't think it's a good idea to take loans 
loans, debt is the devil. Uh, you know, having to work through school, I think that's a good idea. I mean, it teaches character, right? Like, just think of Calvin Hobbes. Like, what would Calvin's dad say? Builds character, right? But anyways, so taking it back to street photography, I think, yeah, just um, the thought to think about street photography, rather than bemoaning and wishing that you had a different type of life or life situation, maybe it's more intelligent to take the life you already have and leverage it to the maximum.